um, last time we got together, we ended up talking about the prodigal son, and <clears throat> we were able to discover several different angles that uh, I'd never heard before. Some of you shared during the halftime also, and it was really, really good. Um, but this time, I want to talk about, um, and we used a title similar to this um, two sessions ago, but this one is different. Two kinds of sons. Two kinds of sons. <clears throat> um, and so we're applying that to our story with the prodigal son. Um, but it's not going to be the kind that you think. It's not going to be the two kinds that you think. What we're going to discover is that, um, that there are born sons and there is the son. There are born again sons and there is the son. And we'll look at a bunch of scriptures uh, in different locations concerning that. But right now, we really, we're really we just going to stick with our story um, of the prodigal son. And we're going to look at these two sons. We're going to read about them. <clears throat> and what we need to see when I read these scriptures is we need to see how um, far both of these sons are from the son. Okay. In other words, usually if you say two different kinds of sons, then you would say, well, the prodigal son who ended up being the good son, and then the elder son who ended up not being so good or whatever. But really, they both got the same nature. They went in different directions. And we always, we always think, well, well, he did this, and so this one's better than that one. <clears throat> but to the father, it doesn't matter because neither one is the son even though they're born into the family, because they are. I mean, the first verse uh, that we read, verse 11, and this is Jesus talking, a certain man had two sons. And so um, as we read uh, the, the actions and the attitudes of each son, I want you to see them in light of what the father's desire was for, for having birth sons. And that was Christ in them, the hope of glory. That was the very nature of the one, the one son. Um, and, you know, I'm just thinking, <clears throat> maybe before I read that, I should read a couple of other scriptures so that we can kind of see this emphasis of the Father. Let's go to Romans 8 and keep your place there in Luke 15 because we will come back. But Romans 8 and, um, and we'll start about verse 28. <clears throat> and of course there are many, many things uh, that we grasp hold of in Romans 8, 28 and 29. But we're going to point out the important thing to God. Not, not, we always see the important thing to us. We always think, see that thing. Oh, oh, that touched me. Or, oh, that helped me. Or, oh, that's good to me. Um, so let's look at it. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, we'll just stop right there. All right, so you see that there is an emphasis on the Father. We know that the, all things work together for those that love God, that, that, that there's a prerequisite there, and it is in relationship to God the Father and to them that are called according to his purpose, not just called according to a ministerial purpose or a life purpose or a marriage purpose or a this or that purpose. But, um, and he goes on to say, whom he foreknew, the ones that he foreknew 
that would end up being saved, he also predestined or has a predestined plan that they be conformed not to Christ, not to all the different words we use, but that the ones that were foreknown be conformed to the Son, to the image of the Son, S-O-N, the Son. So it's talking about those who are foreknown to be in the family. God has a plan for that. Salvation, in other words, in other words, simply being saved is not, is not his heart. It is our heart more than anything else. And we can understand that. Yeah, praise God, I don't want to go to hell. You know, I'm glad I'm saved. But I want... You know, I, there's more that if I find out, and I have, that there, there's more in his heart pertaining to us in relationship to more of his son, then I want a conformity uh, to begin to um, blossom out like a, like a flower that brings forth the image of his son, not, not again, not the image of Christ, not the image of the Savior, not the Messiah, not the da da da, not the, you know, all of the terms, we, not the healer, not the, you know, and a lot of people get saved and then they go, oh, I want to be like Jesus. And so they go into a healing ministry because Jesus healed or they go get just uh, leading people to the Lord because, but there's a, there's a purpose beyond that. There's a calling, there is a um, and, and it's his purpose. That's the exact word in here, his purpose. Because whom he foreknew, he also wants this thing to end up being conformed to the image of his son. And then Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Let's look there also, and then we'll go back to prodigal son. Colossians 1, 13 says this, <clears throat> Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. All right, so um, most people only think in terms of, I got saved, I've been delivered from the devil. I've been delivered from darkness. I've been delivered from sin. All, the, all of the darknesses is, 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 you know, I've been delivered from. And that's, that's, you know, and even after many, 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 many years of salvation, there can be this emphasis on fighting the darkness, on going against something that is holding me back instead of bringing forth Christ that is light that dispels that darkness. Just, just him, not, not his magic power, not Jesus dressed as a wizard going, darkness, be gone. He is light. And when you turn on the light, the darkness flees. So, so our heart, this is a heart situation. Our heart can't be focused on just being sons, born, born sons, born again sons. But the Spirit of God wants to move us. And so, so, and when I say move us, because this, there is not just a deliverance here from, there is a translation into. And he didn't translate us into heaven. He didn't translate us into uh, all the, the things that we think. Um, he tran And this is past tense, by the way. Uh, whom... Uh, who hath, past tense, hath delivered us. The cross actually is effective. But we, we use the cross to get saved and then move on and then fight darkness with our own weapons, carnal weapons. Um, from the power of darkness, and hath, meaning already, past tense, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And how many of you have a Schofield Bible on you right now? A couple of you, Okay. The, in the margin, it shows that the actual Greek words there is hath translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. The son of his love. Um, um, he didn't just love us and translate us. He translated us into the son of his love. The Son 
The Father loves the Son. Um, what was it? I was just thinking of another scripture there for a moment. Oh, and, and so he's, uh, for example, um, Ephesians 1, uh, I think it's verse 6, um, that we have been um, made, accepted in the beloved. Okay, It didn't say he has made us beloved. It says, the one that I love, the beloved, capital B in, in there, is Christ. And we are accepted in him, not by him. And so by being in union with him, by being in oneness with him, by being in, uh, I mean, see, that doesn't seem, we don't even notice that in the scriptures. And it doesn't seem so important until we realize how important the son is to the father, the son, not just being born sons, not just being born again, because we, we think being born again is everything. And it's just, it's like stepping in through the door and then stand, it'd be like going and visiting the father at his house. <laughs> and you step inside the door and you just stand there inside the door, go, well, I'm in. And the whole family's in the back or in the, you know, enjoying the holidays. And you're just standing there. Going, well, at least I'm in. Praise God, that's all that counts. Well, you know, how about come sup with the Father? How about come partake of the feast? How about uh, live for a change instead of exist on a planet? You know? Oh, my God. There's, a, there's enough junk going on in this world. I, you know, if we didn't have a heart for Jesus, it ought to still chase us to him. You know, but you begin to, see, you know, I mean, it should. You just go, oh, my God, this place is crazy. I just need peace. He is made unto you peace. I just need, you know, joy. His joy be fulfilled in you. I just need, you know, and we go, well, Lord, give me. And we're, taught, we're not after him. We're after what he can give. And we're going to get into that in this prodigal son story. Um, okay, so we're going back to uh, Luke 15, <clears throat> and we're going, just a reminder, we're going to read, we're going to read the, the attitudes <clears throat> and the actions of the born-again sons, of the born-again sons. And we're not going to contrast them with one another, prodigal son with elder son. We are going to to see that basically they, got this, they had the same problem. It just manifested differently. It just manifested differently. Okay? All right. Verse 11, starting with verse 11 <clears throat> with the prodigal son. And a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me, give me, give me, give me. Where's the emphasis? Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Far from what? Far from the father. Far from the heart of the father. Far from what God really had for him. Because you, you do know he loves these sons, right? But, it, but the, they're, they're far, into a far country. <clears throat> um, and they're wasted, his substance, with riotous living. Now, Mary of Bethany was accused of wasting, and Jesus said, it's not waste. We are the ones who've been wasting. We waste. We waste the things that should build us up in him as we pursue our own life in this world or as we pursue our own ministry or as we, you know, and we leave the heart of the one who not just made us but made us to be with him. And we spend all of our time doing things that never can get us there. 
All right, the, the elder son, verse 25 through 28. <clears throat> now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And you know the rest of it. You know, you know, you, you know, you've never given me a party. You've never let me invite my friends. And this, but by the way, this, this gathering, this feast, uh, isn't about our friends. It's about the family. It's about the family, the family. What is, what is the DNA of our being that knits us together? It's Christ. It's Jesus. And it's not just Jesus as Savior. It is being conformed to that image. Um, all right. So, let me give you uh, a couple of verses that deal with that clearly divide this reality of being born sons from the son, okay? The, tr the, the action that just says it, that you are sons because you're born again, but there is the son that God wants and is after. So let's, let's begin with a milder one, 1 John 3, uh, verse 1 through 3. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. And I'll read it if you, you know. First John 3, 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. All right, so here we are, sons of God, born again sons of God. This is something that was bestowed upon us. New birth brought us into the family. We are of the family. I don't care how you act, you're of the family. Okay. Um, but he cares. But he doesn't care how you act. It's not, see, he's not, God's not legalistic. <laughs> he wants his son. So don't get off into all that. Um, that we should be called the, the sons of God. And notice the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Well, I thought being born again made us appear what we would be. I thought simply being brought in and saved and in the family automatically made us everything that the father would want. If I had a big gong, I would hit it right now. Gong. <laughs> no. Um, but, but see, knowing that there's more can either put us legally under the law where we freak out because we're not that, or it can cause us to pursue the heart of the father for, for his son, the heart of his father, the heart of the father what's in the Father's heart. See, it's always about our heart. It's always about our life. It's always about our job. It's always about our family. It's always about our things. It's always about us. And to, to break with that is incredibly hard because gravity pulls us to the earth. You know, ungodly gravity. <laughs> Not actual gravity, but ungodly gravity that keeps us bound and thinking about this earth, man. But when Jesus comes, what happens to the gravity? So, um, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay, so there is this, these verses in the Bible that says that as we see him, as we see his face, not some, some supernatural event, but what's called the revelation of Christ as we truly see his faith, not a teaching, not a doctrine that we hold here. 
a doctrine can't do this, but seeing by the Spirit of God, we are changed into the image of that Son. Sons are changed into the image of that Son. And every man that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself, even as Jesus is pure. Then we have, having that hope that, that us as, the, as, as, as sons, born sons, can be more than even saved people that have to, have to live and live off of forgiveness constantly. In other words, our whole life is caught up with, forgive me for what I did wrong, instead of be blessed, Father, for the, the life of the Son. You know, that's touching your heart. Um, and then Galatians 4, Galatians 4, 1 through 6. And let me just read it because we're, how much time we got? Two minutes? <laughs> Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the father. Even so we, when we were children, meaning in the family, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. Now listen to this last verse. And because you are sons, born sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. And this is saying that this is not something that happens at new birth. It's saying you were already a child and you were under tutors and governors and you were messing with the world and you're all this kind of stuff. But this is saying because you're a son of God, because you're in the family, because you belong to him, God wants to send forth now the Son, the Spirit of His Son, into your hearts, crying out by Father. All right, so here in a minute when we get back together again, <clears throat> we want to go back to the prodigal son story. And we want to begin to look at that story this time of the two kinds of sons and the process it's going to take to become to allow that son, the son, override even our birth sonship to the glory of the Father. Amen. All right, let's take a break.